What is up, my hungry hunters? It's Chris with Tabletops and Tentacles, and this is Die Alone, a solo RPG and game podcast. In this episode, I'll be talking about Apex Predator, a monster hunting solo RPG from Peach Garden Games, and The Lost Expedition from Osprey Games. But first, a few news and updates from the Tabletops and Tentacles headquarters hidden deep in Idaho's underground sea. So as you probably noticed, I have been fairly absent for the last month. We've been dealing with all sorts of things here at the headquarters. Uh, Primarily, I've been heads down, absolutely swamped with getting three dice six worked on and prepping issue three of Tabletops and Tentacles. And on top of that, I had a couple of deadlines for uh, the partners RPG I was doing art for, and some Cold War stuff I was doing for Gallant Night Games, and I was just absolutely overwhelmed, and then as the heat really hit us here, which isn't significant here compared to, like, poor Portland and those guys this time of year, but it seems to have exacerbated whatever this mystery medical condition my wife has, and made things complex here um we've been up to the emergency room a few times and at the same time all of our like three month checkups with all of her specialists have also come due so we've been like driving to utah for specialists and that kind of thing and uh, as i sat to really dive into the games that i picked to play for the last few weeks I found myself really struggling. I I mean, if you've listened to the previous episodes of Die Alone, you know I'm a total geek about really experiencing a game when I'm playing it, and I was struggling to do that here. And I, I think part of it's just that I was so absolutely overwhelmed with all of the madness I was dealing with and stress and just... I, I wasn't in the mood for something introspective. <laughs> and so I, I really struggled to dive into playing something and actually enjoying myself. So I kind of took a break from it, and I apologize for that. Um, the other thing I think I've realized is that as a creator as well, I... I wouldn't be real excited if somebody gave me short shrift on a podcast like this for something that I spent a lot of time working on, and more importantly, I would never do that to someone else, and I don't want to record an episode about a game that I only played once or twice. I don't feel like that is enough to... I, despite the fact that this isn't a review podcast per se, I do like my opinions to be at least somewhat informed, even though they are my opinions and they by no means will line up with anyone else's, um, <laughs> particularly when we're talking role playing games. But I still want to, I want to give these games time to breathe and to live a little bit on my table. And that means I am going to be converting our release schedule to a bi-weekly schedule. I'll be putting out two episodes a month, and hopefully each of those will include an RPG and a solo board game of some sort. Uh, But we'll see. Um, I'll definitely have at least one. (laughs) Before we dive into the games this week, I do have a few uh, Kickstarter-related announcements. Uh, first of all, if you backed three die six, I am still hurt at work on that. The delve your own adventure solo zine part of those has been an interesting challenge because the the egg hunt is designed to be very much an old school choose your own adventure game book, and the lost city I. I made the choice to go the opposite direction with it and make it more of like a hex crawl adventure exploration type game. And those are two very different things I realized. I in my head I was thinking, oh, they're both still sort of choose your direction, fight the creature or run away kind of thing. 
but as I started writing each of them, they're very different in tone. Um, the Choose Your Own Adventure stuff is very cliffhangery, narrative-based storytelling, whereas the uh, Hexcrawl style is more of like a discovery and exploration thing. And I'll be really curious to see which people prefer. Um, I know which one is easier for me to write, <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you which, but I definitely have an easier time diving in and getting lost in the world with one way versus the other, but they're both really an, inter uh, an entertaining challenge for me. Um, I'm really I'm loving working on this game. I It kills me that it's not out yet. Um, it was supposed to be out this month, and obviously that's not going to happen, but it is moving along. Uh, the zine version of the core book for 3 Dice 6 is basically ready to rock and roll and I am all in on working on the deluxe core book now as well as a ton of illustrations I've done like 20 new little spot illos for over the last week or so for the different books and it's it's super fun I'm getting really tired of drawing mushrooms <laughs> despite the fact that I have like other shimmer stuff that I want to work on um, beyond that Tabletops and Tentacles issue 3 is now live on Kickstarter, and I am so proud of this issue. So when we first started Tabletops and Tentacles, the plan was to go to cons and promote the magazine, find new subscribers and backers and patrons and that kind of thing that way, but more importantly talk to creators, get interviews, get content, get stuff to review. Um, I had over a dozen panels set up for me to record and transcribe into the different issues of Tabletops and Tentacles. And then, of course, uh, the pandemic hit and all of these best laid plans went off the side of the bridge into the bottom of the chasm in a twisted burning wreck <laughs> so uh and then of course my wife got sick and the collaborative aspect of creating this magazine with my wife went out the window she can't really do any of the editing or writing that she was doing previously so i picked up a couple of reviewers and columnists for issue two and found uh, i found that it helped me become more enthusiastic about the parts I was working on for the magazine. So for issue three, I reached out to a ton of creators and columnists and reviewers, and we are making the biggest issue of Tabletops and Tentacles yet, which is ironic since it was going to be the smallest one. Uh, but it's the cryptid issue, which is all Sasquatch and sea creatures and chupacabras and Mothman and just all that fun woods creatures that I just absolutely adore and I've got over 24 contributors doing role-playing adventures and stories and artwork I think it's going to be my favorite issue so far and it's been an interesting one because we ran a kickstarter for the first issue but it was sort of for the full 10 issues of volume one which only two have come out so far because it's been a crazy year and a half issue three sort of marks a soft reboot for it. We're going to have new content in it. There's going to be like a Troika character in each one. Um, there's a superhero character from Tom Chiaramonte over at uh, Wrong Rocket. Um, I'm going to have an exclusive 3 die 6 character in each one. I'm really excited about this. Uh, it's been getting a good reaction. I think we're just hitting the point here where I can pay all of my contributors. We can pay for shipping and producing the magazine for the backers. And if we get any more backers, I might get to pay myself for the stuff I've done, which is always a good feeling when you're working on a labor of love to make a little cash off of it, too. <laughs> so anyway, there's links to that in the description below, or you can go to tabletopsandtentacles.com and find a link, or you can just go to Kickstarter and type in tabletopsandtentacles, and I will be there. 
waiting for you to pledge. <laughs> um, in other Kickstarter news, I'll be honest, I haven't really looked at any of the new Kickstarters. Um, I was planning on doing my my new releases of our YouTube channel where I kind of do a grok of the new projects that I'm backing and that kind of thing. And I've just been so busy and broke that I haven't really even looked. Um, I am backing the Oracle issue 12, which is a 5e compatible system neutral Celtic themed magazine from the Oracle. They're funded. They've got five days left on it, and it looks really cool. I like that each of their issues is themed. Um, like it's got like a Mushroom Queen NPC and unique locations and stuff on it. And then I'm also backing Nova, which only has about, whew, by the time this is posted, probably 70 hours left. But it's a just an absolute killer uh, mech-filled RPG that's powered by Lumen, which is a specific RPG uh, system from Spencer Campbell. And it looks great. The artwork in it's fantastic. I love the use of color in it. And the graphic design is like this clean, sexy, sci-fi aesthetic. So I'm backing that. Um, I think I'm just getting the PDF of it, if I remember right, because I'm broke. But I couldn't pass it up. It looks really cool. And that's basically all of the news that's fit to talk quietly into a microphone about. So let's move on to the main reason for this show, Dying Alone. And boy, I sure did this week. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, purely by accident, I ended up playing two games about stomping around in the woods, trying not to die. Uh, we played The Lost Expedition from Osprey Games and Apex Predator from Peach Garden Games. And Apex Predator sort of just fell into my lap as the perfect game for me to play this week because it's pretty light. Um, and I'm not saying that like it's a bad thing at all. It is real easy to play. You can set up and play within a couple minutes. And there aren't any crazy complex rules to playing the game, which I think is great. Um, I really needed a game that didn't force me to be introspective and think about my life this week and this is the great one for it uh so uh here's the description for apex predator you are not very big and you are not very strong there are creatures in this world that tower over you that could absolutely tear you asunder if you let your guard down but you are the apex predator you will show them who is the hunter and who is the hunted Apex Predator is a single-player game inspired by Monster Hunter, in which you explore an ancient forest, tracking down and fighting titanic monsters. Along the way, you face peril and find that the natural world may just be on your side. So I really enjoyed this game. Uh, to play it, you need a 10-sided die, a deck of cards, and some tokens or paper and pencil for tracking things. Um... Because I'm a giant nerd, as all of you know that, that have listened to this podcast previously, I used my Matt Guyver cryptid cards for my deck of cards. I used a bunch of coins from Sleeping Gods instead of the uh, markers and pen and paper. And I used... I don't remember what miniature I used, but I used a miniature for the character on it. Uh... <laughs> So in this game, you pick what monster you're hunting, um, and the king of each suit represents the nest of that particular monster, and they're pretty fun. Um, there's four different ones, and each one has a very different personality to it. Um, you can hunt the Drahaya, the Tunnel Lurker. You can hunt the Ruilax, the treetop dragon, Manka, the rainbow devourer, or Rumkal, the roaring menace. And each one is illustrated with this kind of fun watercolor cave painting style. And those are the only real illustrations in the book. It's a fairly simple design as far as that's concerned. Um, but I do really like these. Um, the author on this... Um, 
So I believe this was written by Rachel um, over at Peach Garden Games. Um, it doesn't actually say anywhere in the book who wrote this, um, but I'm relatively certain it was Rachel. Um, and it's definitely a love letter to the Monster Hunter video games in both the sort of the description of the creatures and the way it's written and the way you play the game. Um, so you pick a monster and then you pick a certain number of cards depending on how big of a game you want. Um, you can do a 4x4 grid, a 4x5, or a 5x5 grid. And you lay the cards out face down and you just set the rest of the cards to the side. And you take your little character, you put him on your camp, which I believe is the Ace of Spades, and each turn you walk onto the next space. And it's really fairly simple. Um, each of the cards that you turn over has a different event that happens, and they're written really nicely. I love the evocative way these are done. So, like, let's say we pull the Five of Diamonds. That one is the view of the forest. A tall cliff connects the nearby wasteland with the forest, and with a little effort, you can climb up. The vines grow here like they do everywhere, as tough and rubbery as you've come to expect, and soon you can sit on top and survey the area. The forest is beautiful from here, and you can see the glitter of Finality Falls and the play of the light off the great tree. With luck, you might even be able to see your quarry. You can choose to turn over a card that is not adjacent to this one. So each of the different cards that you run into have different things that happen. Uh, you can gain HP, you can gain advantage, which helps you in the final battle against the monster. You can find tracks, which is sort of the point of this. If you are trying to find monster tracks that will lead you to the nest of the monster so that you can kill it. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I've played it six or seven times. I am not real great at these type of games because I roll awfully. And so when it's something like this where it's just a single die you're rolling, I just, I seem to die all the time. It's just, I mean, that's the name of the podcast, so I guess it's appropriate. But man, I'm awful at rolling a single die. Uh, <laughs> but I had a lot of fun with this. It's, it is it is very simple. You do a lot of flipping in the book. Uh, this is one of those where I wish I had the physical copy because I hate like scrolling through 19 screens to find something. And because the descriptions are evocative and longer and have a little bit of world building built into them, they take up more space than like the wretched that's like five or six pages so there is a little more uh, book flipping but that's a minor complaint obviously i dig this game i thought it was a lot of fun um i really embraced the spirit of it i read all of the paragraphs i listened to old king kong and tarzan soundtracks on spotify while i played and i burned one of our candles that smells like an old rainforest so i I really got into this game. I needed something. I needed something that didn't force me to think about myself and just have fun. And this definitely fit the bill. Um, on its surface, it's fairly simple, which is both a benefit and a negative. Um, I one time I did play it, sort of in between di doing different projects, and I found that I did not enjoy it as much that time because rather than reading each of the paragraphs and sort of immersing myself in the world, I just looked and said, oh, okay, uh, four clubs, I got a monster track, let's move on to the next one. And this type of game, it's very beneficial if you are willing to devote the time and bandwidth required to actually experience the game rather than just play it um there's a few games that i have that i like that type of stuff i mean i play montana solitaire quite regularly because it's literally just me slapping cards down and lining things up and matching stuff and sometimes that's nice and this game actually does work for that but it's it's real strength lies in the writing and the world of the jungle that you're tromping around in. I find that if you just dive into this game just to play it, so to speak, you feel like you're just turning over cards and then rolling a die over and over to try and kill a monster. And that... 
it sort of cheapens the game itself. Um, and that's the case with pretty much all of these solo RPGs. It's so beneficial if you want to crawl into the world of solo RPG games to be willing to live in that world. And I, I'm delighted at that experience and I'm delighted that it exists because if it didn't, I would probably be one of those guys that like print and plays games and spends more money trying to get them to look like a production copy than it would to just buy the game in the first place. <laughs> so this sort of fits my solo RPGs fit my creativity into things, but it also fits sort of my my anal retentive end of things as well to craft and pimp out and play with things in a way that's sort of low pressure as well. I I picked up this as part of the solo but not alone jam on itch and like there were so many in that thing that I paid like maybe a dollar for this and I played it for a week and had a really fun time with it and it was worth far more than that um and that's both a benefit and a negative of these really cool little indie solo RPGs is that they probably should be paying more for them but at the same time it's so easy for me to be like two bucks sure and <laughs> I'll play it eventually that's why I made this podcast so that it forces me to play it eventually uh <laughs> but uh anyway so that's Peach Garden Games uh they're on Twitter at Peach Garden RPGs and I will throw links to the game itself in the description. I have to admit I've recorded this podcast twice now, and the first time I had the power out, uh, the power go out on me, and I didn't realize it because I was sitting in the dark like a weirdo, and recorded into the night. And uh, no one's ever going to hear that one unless you were being a creeper outside my window. So if this one feels a little off, I apologize. I am, I'm at the end of a very long week and my brain is not firing on all cylinders, but I did enjoy Apex Predator. If you are looking for a lighter game in particular, this is the perfect one. It doesn't have journaling aspects or a Jenga tower or force you to think about your feelings or anything like that. And, oh my gosh, that's one of the things I love so much about these solo games is I'm starting to get a catalog of them where I'm like, oh, these are games I play when I want to feel creative and think about things. And these are games I play when I just want to play a game and not think about things. And the fact that all of that exists. I mean, that's how games are in general, but that you can boil it down into these clever little solo RPGs just delights me. I love it. I I get more thrills out of these $5 PDFs than I do a $100 board game sometimes or a $50 video game. And I think that that's really, really cool. I I mean, obviously, I like solo RPGs. I'm doing a podcast about it. But I'm just constantly impressed with how cool and different and weird some of them are. <laughs> so speaking of weird and components and jungles and whatnot, The Lost Expedition is the other game I played. Legendary explorer Perry Fawcett marched deep into the Amazon in search of El Dorado. He was never seen again. Your team is following in his footsteps, but in searching for riches, you must be careful not to lose the greatest treasure of all. The friends you made along the way. I mean, your life. Uh, <laughs> make the best of your food, your ammunition, and your health as you plunge deep into the jungle. So this is a game from Pierre Sylvester, with art by Garen Ewing, who is a... Excellent choice for the art on this game, in my opinion. I know that this game's a little bit of a love-hate 
thing for people because the art isn't something you see in games a lot. It has a fairly indie European look in terms of the line art and illustration style. I uh, Unfortunately, the, the interior art looks like it's all digitally colored and the cover has like a much more beautiful watercolor look to it that I would have preferred. Uh, the inside art is a little garish but it's still really nice i love uh ewing's art i it, it's it really speaks to me in terms of like the old school like heavy metal and mobius and stuff that i used to love when i was really collecting comics hardcore and it's all presented in a way that really does showcase the art because they are on the largest, silliest cards I've ever tried to shuffle <laughs> in my life. Uh, so these cards are like, so I think they're about the same height as a tarot card, but they're the dimensions of a poker card. So they're like, they're fat and tall. And I would say like maybe like a poker card plus 60% approximately. And they are like silly big. I... I don't know if this was a graphic design choice to show off the art or if it was a financial choice to make the box bigger so that it could sell for more or what the I'm, I'm really curious what the, the the logic was in making cards that I could use to like shingle a roof with. Uh, <laughs> They're cool, though. I actually, I love the, the way the art's presented on them. Um, the iconography is all very clear because it's all kind of big. I'm honestly, like, <laughs> I, I don't know how to say this. Uh, like, from an artist standpoint, there are almost uncomfortable spaces of emptiness on these cards. <laughs> I know that sounds really weird, but, like, like, if these were poker-sized cards, the font they use and the text that they used and the iconography would all feel normal. But because they're all big, they, like, they they somehow, like, inexplicably make me feel like a little kid while I'm playing the game. And it's not a little kid game. Um... <laughs> so I'm a I'm a huge jungle exploration fan. I'm sure it all stems from me being too young the first time I watched Predator and I love that movie and I will watch literally anything that has somebody tromping around in a jungle in it and I will listen to audiobooks about weird tropical diseases and skin eating funguses and things and this game captures a lot of that in a way that I was really impressed with. It's a rough life out there in the jungle, especially back in Fawcett's time frame. And in the Lost Expedition, you play four, uh, you control four uh, guides as you are attempting to reach El Dorado. I played this game off and on for about two and a half weeks, and I am... Never going into the jungle because I will die right away. <laughs> the number of times I died in this game, often before I was even in the jungle for more than a couple of days, is... It's very humbling as someone who was a Boy Scout and thinks he's vaguely competent in the woods. Because boy, oh boy, I am real bad at jungle life. <laughs> Uh, so the balance in this is great. They have a lot of stuff like um, different native tribes you talk to and river crossings and venomous spiders and poisonous frogs and uh, things eating your rations and things. And everything is a delicate balancing act to keep things stocked or keep things alive. And it forces you to make some really difficult decisions at times whether you want to use that one bullet to get to meat or if you want to save that bullet for later and avoid dying because you can fend off a venomous snake or something like that and the resources are very limited the characters all are just different enough 
that you have to make some hard choices sometimes on who's not going to survive the night. And I was really impressed by that. Um, all of my comments about the size of the cards aside, this is a really nicely made game. The box is a great size. It's like seven by eight or something like that. It's just a tiny little perfect box for taking on, like, I, t I, I would totally bring this up to the woods with me and play it in the jungle, uh, except I'd die. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, the cards are really nice. They have a, like a matte finish to them that doesn't glare too much when you're playing. And, and like, it's got like just a simple little meeple and some nice tokens. And it's just a really nicely designed little box game that could have been half the size if they used regular cards. Um, but honestly, I, I don't begrudge them because personally, I love the art and it's a fairly small footprint even with these big cards because you are playing like a certain number of cards each day. You have to make some really interesting decisions about inventory management, what you are going to use to get certain benefits or to avoid certain penalties. Some of those choices are really difficult. I really sucked at some of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, this can also be played co-op, and I honestly think it would be really... I actually think it would be more fun to play co-op just because there are some interesting decisions that have to be made that would be a little more compelling if discussed with someone else. I think my brother and I would really enjoy this game playing together, um, but... It's a great game. It's super fun. It's jungles. There's like killer ants and fungus and infection and gangrene. And you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> so like uh, uh, everything else, I'll have links to this in the description over on our website and assorted social medias. Um, but that is The Lost Expedition. Uh, it also has an expansion pack called The Fountain of Youth and Other Adventures that adds... A little more fantastic stuff to it, like it's got were beasts and zombie conquistadors and whatnot. And I have not played it. Um, I have it, but I haven't played it because I kept telling myself I would make it slightly further to El Dorado before I played it, and I never did. My bones bleached in the sun of the tropical jungles. Uh, <laughs> I do appreciate, though, that the, the game, it's like a bunch of mini expansions, and you can choose to add all of them or some of them, and some of them increase the difficulty, some of them make the game easier. Maybe I should try those. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's really nice. Everything looks perfect, and it meshes perfectly with the Lost Expedition as well. So those were my forest and jungle-related dives that I did this week. So I think that brings us to the end of an especially rambling episode of Die Alone. I hope you enjoyed it. I normally have this a little more planned out than I did, but between everything crashing on me and it just being a crazy week, I was like, I'm just going to sit and get this recorded. Uh, so it's a little more talkatively random than usual, but I hope you enjoy it all the same. Um, as always, if you'd like to support the channel and the podcast and the other weird crap we do. You can find links to everything on tabletopsandtentacles.com. I would love it if you give issue three of Tabletops and Tentacles a try over on Kickstarter. I'm super, super proud of it. And as always, you can also go to Patreon at patreon.com slash deeply dapper and become a curiosity over there. That helps me... Well, it helps me feed my dog <laughs> and buy coffee. And I'll tell you what, I need some coffee. Uh, as always, as well, if you are a game creator, particularly if you make solo games, or if you have something you'd like us to review in the magazine, The Tabletops and Tentacles, where we review film, books, games, toys, uh, virtually anything you want to give us, we will talk about it in the magazine. But you can contact me at tabletopsandtentacles at gmail.com. If you would like to get in touch about a game to play here on the podcast or anything else you want to promote, I would love to 
help out any other creators any way I can in spreading the word. And I'm just going to keep talking, apparently. So why don't I say this? Remember, we all die alone. I'll see you in two weeks, everyone. Thanks for listening.